Hi, this is Say Your Name, and you're listening to the FSF Podcast. Did I do it right? Fantastic. I love that, actually. We're going to keep that one. The show where Captain Picard wishes that we hadn't made it so, but Captain Shaw still tells us no. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Redshirt Crewman number 128. He'll know that when he puts on the red shirt and joins Captain Liam Shaw in deleting Riker's playlist from the library, that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope. Because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of his Malbec. All right, guys, our guest today is an actor. Uh, uh, he does voice work. He's a writer. Not to mention he runs one of the coolest nerd websites that I've come across in a while. Um, where we're going to be getting some dice and some shirts from because they're, they're freaking awesome. And out of all the things that you will know him from, clearly his new character has caused quite a stir and a level of excitement in the Star Trek community as of late as Captain Liam Shaw in the season three of Star Trek Picard. We are thrilled to welcome Todd Stashwick to the FSF podcast. Welcome to the show, Todd. Who, me? Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Couldn't be. Could be, for sure. <laughs> Did you steal the cookies from the cookie jar? I didn't steal cookies from the cookie jar. Uh, hi, friends. Hello, hello. Hey, so before we jump into anything Trek-related, I, I do actually want to talk to you about your website because this will become very expensive for me. Um, I was looking that over, and I'm showing my wife. I was sitting there last night with my iPad, and I'm like, oh, my honey, look at that. I'm, I'm going to have to get that. A couple seconds, I was like, oh, my God, look at that. I'm going to have to get that. Uh, so my it's called favorite the thing on the website. Okay, go on. I'm going to let you finish uh, yeah, yeah. plugging me. Yeah, it's called uh, the nerdcircus.com. Uh yep. the, between the lava the lava dice which are amazing. Those They're things fun, look right? so Oh my They're god, cute. they look so cool. You want to uh, eat them. Right? They look like candies. They really do. The little they look like delicious orange candies. Exactly. But they reminded me of the gloopy glops from lava lamps. And if you notice <laughs> there's a big sort of 70s vibe on the oh, on the site. I did. I did and I absolutely enjoyed it. There's the the libations books, the shirts, and I'm like I'm just kind of adding this all up in my head, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah. hey, honey, you know that second job you were talking about? That might yeah. need to be a thing. Yeah. So my favorite thing is the is the uh, is the dice box created by Charles Thurston, because when we were when we were uh, young nerds uh, in the '80s, you know, playing the dungeons as well as the dragons, we played them in wood panel basements with orange shag carpet. And so I wanted my dice box to look well, so a shaped like a cigar box, uh, because that's what we used to keep all our dice and minis and pencils in, um, or or obviously a crown royal bag. But then B, I wanted it to be its own little basement. And so if you look at the box, it looks like wood paneling, and there is mini shag carpet inside. And that yeah, it's me, super cool. It just that's tickles awesome. me. Yeah, yeah, that's and those cool, are man. those are made to order by uh artist Charles Thurston. Uh he he handcrafts each one of those. They're not off some assembly line. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, so cool. here's I have a question for you about your website. Yes. So I'm looking, I'm looking at all this stuff and I'm like I said, adding it up in my brain. But what I'm wondering is what was your inspiration to start this site? I know you said you were a nerd in the 80s and you know we're all having fun with it and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what was your process for adding things to the website? Because basically you're adding your name to the design of whatever's going out there, because this is, you know, Stashwick's nerd circus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the inspir so uh, I'll give you a little peek. So this is where I spend a, an inordinate amount of my days. Love it. Okay. So this is the nerd layer, right? Oh, that's um, awesome. And, um, and this is where I play D and D on my, signature dungeons and dragons uh table yeah i saw that on the website table. so so where it came from uh, i know this is an audio podcast so that that panorama is useless actually um, we're video as well so they will see it hot damn so um <laughs> so uh during lockdown uh i had idle hands which is a very dangerous thing for me uh and and i had been toying with the idea of of entering the uh the uh the third market ancillary nerd merch uh site because this stuff um like nerd dumb sits in my in my little soul sits firmly like 
mid 70s forward like 77 like that's mm-hmm. when it all started for me if you think about 1977 it was star wars atari uh the rank and bass hobbit like so many things that formed the the foundation of who i am today uh started that year and um and so when i started playing D D around 79 like we played them in wood panel basements with thorn shag carpet. And so, so much of my nerddom feels like late seventies, early eighties. And I wanted to create stuff that extended that feeling out to like, you want to share your version of what you love, how you love it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of the, the, so I'm like, well, how do I create unique products that give my version of the love and maybe people can nerd along with me in that way. So I tried to, for the most part, create things that whiff of that vibe. That's why the the byline is uh, groovy wares and nerdy paraphernalia. Um, And so I want the lava lamp dice and they're in a little purple bag like the crown royal bag. And and then my my son designed my tie glasses, but they're kind of like those Burger King glasses that you used to get like Return of the Jedi or Empire Strikes mm-hmm. Back or the great Muppet caper. Uh, like I wanted them to feel like those collectible glasses. Are you going to show me? You're going to show me, aren't you? Here it comes. Drum roll, like please. That Return of the Jedi like glass? that right there. This is what I'm talking about. So I created my tie glasses that kind of have that vibe that my son did a little cartoon for uh t-shirts that look somewhat like concert t-shirts uh mm-hmm. like i have like a, i have an ac ssdc and if you know you know that's the one i want god yeah. that's awesome yeah and if you know you know uh it, it's uh it's a fun one for those about to roll we salute you um so that was the, the the site, and so it was also during lockdown. So I'm like, I had time to do the research and find the, the the to set up the site and take the pictures and create the merchandise. And then I met Brandon Cleely, and we created the uh, the Mystic Libations book because we were playing a lot of Zoom D and D. I want to show you guys something cool real quick. Uh, we were playing a lot of Zoom D and D. Ready? Tell him, Gary. Oh, sweet. oh, God, that's awesome that's gary um so we're playing a lot of <laughs> zoom D. that's and, awesome uh, and and so I, I wanted something to you know we were feeling all kind of disconnected obviously during the the, the height mm-hmm. of lockdown and and D D was a way that we were all connecting online and and i said well, what if we were all making the same cocktail and brandon uh neck deep in tiki culture he actually was one of the uh, art designers and, and set dressers for Trader Sam's at Disneyland. And he knew, you know, the bartenders there and, and everything. So we started making D&D inspired cocktails. And then that turned into the book. We kickstarted it and that turned into the book. And so in many ways, like the nerd circus, since my life is and my career is, I've done so many of nerdy shows, Supernatural, Buffy, Enterprise, uh, 12 Monkeys, and mm-hmm. now this little known title known as picard um this independent heard of that uh this obscure uh star trek thing so uh (laughs) so so uh my life is a nerd circus like in my off hours i play D &D, i put together lego i you know i collect toys and then my professional life that feeds my childish habits is spent in nerddom as well so my life is a nerd circus so basically the long answer to your simple question is uh, that's why it's called the Nerd Circus. The room that we're in is called the Nerd Lair. Uh, it it all just kind of points towards uh, my soul. That's awesome. Love Amazing. it. Absolutely love it. So looking at your IMDb resume. Uh, Which I do every day. Do you upkeep it yourself? No, I just stare at it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So you're up credit, you're credited with an upcoming project that's listed as being in post-production. So what can you tell us about the project entitled Shopping for Superman Without NDA Issues? Oh, it's a it's a documentary, I believe, about uh comic book stores. I believe. Oh, okay. I mean, I shot it a long time ago. It was just an interview that I did. Uh a shopping Superman. Yeah, it, I think I was just interviewed about uh 
comic books in that. And again, I may have lost the friend because it's been a while. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, on IMDb. It's... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you. I was just saying it's your on show, IMDb, man. It's your show. <laughs> no, on IMDb, it just said that uh, it was talking about um, uh, the necessity or, or the importance of of the the neighborhood comic book shop and 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 you know as a, as not just a hangout but for, for where people could go to meet other people of, of like minded people, you know, yeah. and, uh, and that kind of as being a, a cultural hangout. Yeah, when I was a kid uh, in the suburbs of Chicago, because yeah, that's factually accurate. I'm a dipshit from Chicago. Um, <laughs> the uh, the uh, the local comic book shop for us was Moon Dogs, Moon Dog Comics Book in Schaumburg, Illinois, and then the the local hobby shop was uh, the Hobbyist, where we would buy our dice and metal figures and our our pink box to uh, to uh, play the dungeon. And I lived. Uh, and I'm actually returning there next week. Uh, I lived uh, and would go to camp in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, and we would oh. walk to the Dungeon Hobby Shop, which was ground zero for TSR, uh, the creators of D&D. &D. I'm actually so, very cool. I'm going there next week for Gary. Yeah, you're going to Gary Con? Yeah. Say hi. I think I'll be having a, 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 a like a, a autograph meet and greet table oh. on, thir on Thursday if you want to swing by and say, "Hey, it was me from the from the thing." Okay, from the fissa fissa. I from will the definitely try to check you out there. So check me out. Yeah, exactly. just from cool. a distance. You can put yeah, dollars got... in my belt. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got friends. I, my friends. My family actually lives in Woodstock, Illinois, just south. Oh, of, I love like, Woodstock. Need... Yeah, Woodstock's Beautiful. an amazing little town. Yeah, where so, are you guys located? We're in Michigan, so I'm close to uh, Lake Michigan on the on the west side of Michigan. Uh, Nick's more centrally located, uh, just cool, out, cool. So just a little south of uh, Lansing. I was in Detroit uh, for a spit during Second City days. I, I I performed at Second City Detroit. Nice, uh, I'm very well versed cool. in, in all Michiganian content. Excellent. Yeah. All right, Todd. You're also credited with being a writer for a video game called Forspoken, an action yes, I am. style a co RPG. Yeah, co-writer. Co-writer. It came out on PS5 and for PC gaming. Uh, so tell us about the game, if you would, and what? How does writing for a video game differ than other writing formats? Okay. How uh, you want to know about the game? The game is it is a classic uh, tale as old as like the it's the um you know it's it's the wizard of oz it's it's alice in wonderland it's the it's the modern day connecticut yankee in king arthur's court it's it's about a young gal uh feeling uh kind of at the end of her rope in new york city modern day who through uh, a course of events suddenly finds herself in a um a land where magic is real and dragons are afoot and there are monsters and there are evil queens and she suddenly finds herself the reluctant savior of this land uh and there's magic and there's fighting and there's monsters um it's really fun fast-paced uh magic is your only weapon uh and you get spells and whatnot and you are sort of literally uh bound to this sentient uh bracelet known as cuff that talks to you it's kind of your traveling companion so it's a bit of a, a an unholy alliance between this this medieval uptight British intelligence uh, combined with this this girl who uh, who uh, who very smart gal from uh, from New York City, uh, this kind of modern modern teen. Well, she's not a teen. She's like twenty one. This young this young lady from uh, from New York City. And that's the story of the game. Um, that's cool. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, and what was the other question? How does writing a video game differ uh, right. than writing in other formats? It doesn't on one level. You're still kind of dealing with a three-act structure of, uh, of when you're telling a kind of a linear narrative. Now, what you do do is – I said do do. Uh, <laughs> what you do do is um, – you kind of pull the needle off the record uh, in the uh, in certain points of the narrative because it becomes what they say what they call on the sticks, where 
now for much of the traversal and action and the movement uh, where that would be in a movie, you know, you would watch Frodo and the gang going over the Misty Mountains. Um, the player is in control of that. And the player, uh, the player is the one who furthers the action of the story. And, you know, there's gated moments where, like, they have to get through all of this before it will unlock the next cinematic. Now, me as a writer, I am still with my writing team, not my writing team, the writing team, I didn't assemble them. Uh, with the writing team, um, we are still beating out a hero's journey, if you will, a three-act mm -hmm. structure with all of the same beats, the upturns and downturns that you would find in any traditional media, except that it's just longer. I mean, as opposed to like a 110-page script, you're now writing a 350-page script because you're filling 20 hours of content. Yeah, I, I have. Uh, it does sound like a lot of fun. I'm gonna. I want to check it out on. I don't have uh a ps5 but i can get it on steam so i'm gonna there you go it on there so it's it's fun it's a lot of fun and the and it's fast-paced uh action the the, yeah, the ability the, to switch between the spells is really fun yeah all the reviews i read about it said that uh um it needs a little time to set up the story you, but once you get about an hour or so into the game you said give it give it the hour and then uh, yeah, I mean, you say that it's amazing. The story content from then on out is amazing. Yeah, I mean, look, look, like any any story you're doing, you have to do setup. You have to see what's at stake. You try to oh, get sure. to, you try to get people to care about the character and want to keep fighting for them to survive in these environments. And you don't you don't get the payoff without understanding the dilemma and why her back is against the wall in the first place and why she goes from the frying pan into the fryer. Like it's the careful what you wish for. I mean, she mm -hmm. is looking for somewhere that's green. Like, you know, she, she wants to find a place outside of the cement maze that is New York and she gets more than she bargained for. And so, mm -hmm. so it takes time for us to build that narrative. Uh, it takes time for you to get acclimated to the new surroundings, understanding the mechanics of using her power, because she doesn't have those powers when you're in New York. So it's it, it's a slower building process, and, and obviously some wanted that to be a faster building process, but it is it is how these things lay out uh, oh, yeah. to tell the story in the way that we chose to tell it. I look at it this way. I think we're in a generation where most people, uh, you know, especially the younger generation, they want they want instant gratification. You know, let's get it right here, right now. They're not ready for this. They're not willing, rather, to allow for setup on things. And I think that if you're going to have a good story, something that that people are going to want to spend their time on, you're going to have to give it a foundation. You you need setup. You do. And yeah. Look, if there's nothing we've learned about the internet, it's really nuanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it isn't um it's just <laughs> the, the idea i mean we're we live in a very thumbs up thumbs down culture uh i like it i don't like it right. uh, and so uh you know i think i think giving something the time that it needs hopefully will be a, a bigger payoff for you in the long run uh i look i can't control what people like and what they don't like uh Oh, you yeah. just try to put your heart and soul into a project and 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 hope for the best um uh and then you release it to the wild and see what kind of response it gets uh, i think people ultimately are really actually having a blast with the game and i think yes. there's really wonderful surprises buried deeper and deeper and deeper in the story twists and turns that are just you know unexpected yet completely earned and and i'm very proud of the work that we did we should be yeah yeah i and this is the other thing i said i've said this on a couple other interviews uh talking to people who have put stuff out and i look at it this way uh in the in the age of the internet that we live in where people are so willing to jump on and crap all over something just because they can the cl <laughs> anything over a four star rating in my mind is a five uh so if especially <laughs> the closer you get to a five and i because uh four spoken from what i've seen is between 4.5 and 4.7 on 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 most places that I've seen it reviewed. So to me, 
that means it's actually probably really good. And the couple of naysayers just need to be overlooked. It, so. I mean, it, it, it is. And I'm, look, I'm not above criticism. I, I, I'm, we're all, it's all a process. It's all, we're all learning and growing and, and sure. trying to improve. And I am just one piece of that whole puzzle, right? I was part of the narrative team. I wasn't part of the directing team. I wasn't part of the casting team. I wasn't part of the, the animators. I wasn't part of the editors or the game mechanics or the level designers. I mean, there's so many things that go into making oh sure making video games that that uh, you know. I'm always impressed that things get finished. <laughs> like, it's like there's Absolutely. so much yeah. happening, and and uh, and I've I've put a. I think I put a good five or six hours into the game myself and I'm having a great time. Uh, I'm able to kind of jump into it objectively and, and go, yeah, this is a lot of fun. Um, And as far as what you were saying earlier, which is, which is about our, our, you know, the culture that we live in, uh, everybody's a critic. I mean, we have a, we have a cottage industry of clicks, right? And so headlines of why this thing is horrible tend to draw people in because people really enjoy watching something get ripped apart. Now, I vowed long ago that I would be a creator, not a critic. It doesn't mean I love everything. I just keep my lousy opinion. Or if I, if I have a, a lousy opinion of something, I keep it off the internet because I don't need to spend time putting people towards the thing I don't like. I would rather put them towards the thing that I like uh, sure. and, and, Solid. and fa- fan the flames of the good in this world as opposed to fan the flames of negativity. Absolutely. Ultimately, ultimately, everybody's there to make up your own minds. One person's treasure is another person's trash and so fun. And so, but, but with a YouTube culture where people have made it their business to trash movies, to trash games, mm-hmm. to trash story, to, uh, uh, I want to see a thumbs up, thumbs down on trash. <laughs> Like just go through garbage and go. This garbage sucks, or this is really boring. awesome garbage. Yeah, this this garbage is cringe. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, again, like I I would rather know that I took a risk and I put something out there that I made a thing in this world that I hoped people would enjoy. Again, I'm not above creative, constructive criticism. Uh, I am not, I'm not, uh, I, I, I avoid the culture of, uh, people that make it their trade to creatively destroy something verbally. Understood. I just don't have, like, I, I would rather go make a thing that's hopefully brought to bring delight rather than spend my energy bringing things down. Absolutely. And that's, that's kind of the whole purpose of this show. I, I don't, I don't think even when we, even when we do criticize something, it's never to, to trash it. It's to, it's to talk about, to talk about it, but we'll, we'll usually find something that we can highlight that's positive about it. And know? I think people want to like something. And if they don't, they feel betrayed or uh, they feel they take it personally. I mean, look at the toxicity that star Wars has brought up and, uh, the tribalism that forms in that community, the tribalism that forms in the Star Trek community. I think, I think it's a wide world and it's a cynical world and let people find their joy where they find it, man. Absolutely. I can get behind that. So when you were younger, you aspired to perform at the Chicago's famous, the second city, which yes. you eventually got to do and you got to tour along with them. So how did that help you in preparing for your roles for like today? And how did that goal, achieving that goal, just add to your? Well, several, several things, obviously, like, you know, I I grew up just wanting to be a Ghostbuster. I just wanted to be Bill Murray. Like, that was my goal. I grew up watching Meatballs and Stripes and Saturday Night Live, and I just loved Bill Murray. I just loved his irreverence and his dryness and his provocateur. And, you know, I, I just adored his whole vibe. He was playful without being harmful uh, in that Bugs Bunny way. Like, <laughs> I, I always love the fact that he could, as somebody said, level institutions by raising an eyebrow. Um I think, uh, so I just wanted to be him. And then, so I, I plotted the trajectory of, of Bill Murray and it's like, oh, he went to Second City. Okay, then that's my goal. And and all through college, I knew that when I got out of college, I wanted to go right into 
doing sketch and improvisational comedy in Chicago, and I already lived in Chicago, so it wasn't a tough commute. Um, and so, uh, so then, then I, you know, I made sure I got a foundation. I started studying at Second City. I started studying at Improv Olympic and performing at Improv Olympic and performing at Second City and getting all of those uh, experiences. And then when I did eventually get hired to Second City, it goes back to that, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours. Like I was thrown into trial by fire, like earning my, my stripes by getting in a van and going all over the United States to ply my trade, getting up in front of college audiences night after night and doing comedy and doing sketch. And, and so you, you build a lot of muscles. You build a lot of honing those skills of, of, of improvisation and doing scene work and acting and breaking stuff down and then pack it all up and go on to the next town. And then, then eventually came back to Chicago and did second city Detroit and did second city Northwest. And all of that then set the stage to audition for Saturday night live, which I did, but I didn't get, but it moved me to New York. So I think it was just from an early age from like 23 to 27, just spent those years in Chicago creating theater and really honing and getting training and trial by fire and failure and success and all that. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. All right, Todd, let's talk about the 10,000 pound elephant in the room. That is of course, Star Trek Picard, that little known series that nobody really watched. At this um, independent, independent channel. Yeah. Kind of... Yeah. Nobody's heard of it, but we're going to talk about it anyway. All right. So now for many playing in the Star Trek universe in any form is a dream come true. So in your case, in the story of Todd Stashwick, what does it mean to you personally to have a role in Star Trek and a role that has people asking for more of you, more of uh, more of Liam Shaw? What does it mean? Well, obviously, it's like it, it fills the cup and spills over, right? Like the the fact that I had an opportunity to not once but now twice put my thumbprint in the star trek lore between this and enterprise right um, and then to be able to do it with the next gen reunion cast and to do it uh with my dear friends sean tretta and chris monfett and most the head of the head of the uh head of the spear being my dear friend terry metallis who created the role for me uh, who was my showrunner on 12 Monkeys and then my showrunner on Picard. It just was, and then getting to work with Franks again after working with him on Burn Notice. I mean, it just was such a confluence of fortune and a confluence of creativity and a confluence of opportunity. Uh, and then to see, to be humbled, humbled, humbled by the response that uh, this dip from chicago is getting uh this knucklehead uh i, I describe him he has a blue color grace uh about him um and then seeing people call for a a a, a spinoff series it's like well that's all lovely uh it's so heartening and it's an embarrassment of riches and all the other hyperbolic descriptions i could reach for um you know look if 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 all I get in my life in, in the Star Trek universe is is a three-episode arc on Enterprise and uh, season three of Picard where people responded immensely well to this character, then my belly's full. If it goes beyond that, as I've said in the past, I am Aragorn and they have my sword. Mm -hmm. um, Love it. You know, if they sound the horn of Gondor, I am showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Love the reference. Awesome. So we have a Facebook group and it has over 210,000 members and yes between 210,000 members yep. yeah almost two just, we're just shy of 211 right now it's just filled with memes one thing after another and it <sighs> literally blew up and Congratulations. We started the podcast Thank you. <laughs> so we love to get them involved with our questions as well 
So we asked them if they had any questions for you. And so here are a few. You want to start us off, Tim? Bring it on. Sure. Yeah. So one of them comes from a, a good friend of ours, uh, one of the writers from Phineas and Ferb, and his friend of the show. His name is Joshua Pruitt. Okay. And Josh wants, he, he says, there's a real richness to Shaw's character and his arc that makes him, uh, so far, that makes him a real standout amongst Trek's captains. Where did you find yourself connecting with him on the page or or what stood out to you? And did you have a prime directive approach to how you wanted to play him? Well, that's a lovely question. Uh, well, the fun part is, and the rare part is, and the fortunate part is, uh, it was crafted for me by, as I had said earlier, Sean Trotter, Chris Montfett, Terry Metalis, Oliver Grigsby, and then the and Chris Derrick, like a bunch of other writers, uh, Matt Akamura, uh, on the staff of, of Picard before I got there. And so having Terry uh, craft this character because he had worked with me for four seasons on 12 Monkeys. So when, when you're acting on a show, when you get cast on a show, often the trajectory is we wrote this character then we find this actor and then as the season goes on and the series goes on we start to craft the character to really suit the voice of the actor now that often that's a here here's a suit put it on welcome to the show and then they start tailoring the suit to fit mm -hmm. the actor and then so over the course of four seasons of 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 12 monkeys they really knew how to write to my instrument, my, I, my voice, my whatever, whatever frilly term you want to use for what I do on screen. Um, with Shaw, all of that work happened before I ever got there. So they were already, and again, I'm humbled by this, they were already calling him Captain Stashwick in the room when they were envisioning him. So they were already thinking of him in terms of my strengths as a performer so when i would get the scripts it was like getting a suit that was tailored to me already that they knew my measurements and so so much of the work was already done they told me his backstory they told me his tragedy they told me all of these things so that from from day one shooting you know when, when you see that dinner scene with me and the legacy legends mm -hmm that is Riker and Picard uh, and Seven, uh, all of that was already underneath because I knew it all. Uh, so that was my preparation. Uh, in terms of the performance of it, you know, I started to do my take. I could kind of hear how they wanted me to sing their song and I started singing it. And on day one, Terry was like watching on the monitor and he walked up to me, he goes, 100% that, keep doing that, whatever it is, that's him right there and so i was given permission to chase it down with my instincts and then you know you have the directors frakes and doug and 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 everybody off to the side like kind of going all right do it more like this this time Ooh, go deeper <laughs> down that way this time so that, that's the director's job is to kind of conduct the uh the singing of it all very cool so jesse Thanks. from Jesse from Open Pike Night wants to ask, do you currently or would you in the future consider offering a line of facial hair products under the brand Taj Dash Wax? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, sure, why not? Uh, I had I figured I'd let the, the guy with the stash ask you a stash question, you know, so it made, made sense. It's perfect. All right, we've I'd got another question. It. Exactly, right? <laughs> I'd grow one out, but then I wouldn't be able to stop laughing at myself in the mirror. So, uh, All right, so we have another question from another podcast. Uh, some friends of ours from the Scarif podcast. They're a Star Wars-based podcast out of the Chicagoland area. Um, but they Talk about ask, their favorite film, Star Wars. Exactly. That's, that's, that's how we say it in Chicago. Star Wars. You guys see uh, Star Wars? Are oh, so good. They got laser swords. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the guys from the Scarif podcast want to know when you're when you're back home in Chicago, where do you go for pizza? 
Uh, well, I, by, by my mom, because my mom lives, uh, my mom lives in Huntley, Illinois. Uh, we go okay. to Papa Severio's, but you know, I love the Lou's. I love Leona's. I love Nancy's. Uh, Pizzeria Uno. You know, I, I, I love a deep dish. I love a good deep dish pizza. I know a lot of people think it's casserole, but I don't. I grew up with it, so don't <laughs> uh, don't get on my ass about this. This is what I like. A good, um, a good Chicago style deep dish pizza is amazing. Oh if my God. I love it. One slice and you can go take a nap on a couch. She so. said after three. My three. Exactly. <laughs> well, Todd, thank you so much for being on our show today. Where can our listeners go to find out more about you and your works? To find out about me? Oh, Jesus, Wikipedia. I don't know. Where do you go to find out about somebody? Um, if they're interested in following my nonsense, you can go to Instagram at T Stashwick. Go to Twitter at Todd Stashwick. You can go to uh, thenerdcircus.com, which is where I hawk my groovy wares and nerdy paraphernalia. Um, beyond that, uh, you could... Pay a private detective to follow me around. I don't know. I don't know. Fair enough. Go through my garbage and rate my trash. This is cringe. <laughs> this, this trash is so cringe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will make sure that we put those in our show notes so that our, just our, so that our listeners can look at those descriptions. And You're drunk, aren't you, Nick? Don't judge me. <laughs> I'm not judging. I'm, I, I'm jealous. <laughs> Unlike unlike Shaw, I, I I'm a whiskey man, not a moment. Uh, so uh, I, uh, Daddy likes his bourbon. Um, ooh, nice. All right, guys. We just want to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing you can do to ensure that we get more amazing guests like Mr. Todd Stashwick here today and have these funny moments for you to be able to listen to. So please subscribe. It helps us well more than we'll ever, ever be able to tell you. And please be able to go check out Chad's trash and you can rate it as cringe or, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Yep. But for whatever reason, if you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. That of course is Roman Cyanus, the black mask from TV's Gotham. Ah, uh, that's me. A, Wait that a second. You. That's me. You're talking about me. <laughs> would I remind you that Roman is not someone to be trifled with. This ruthless no. crime lord is tired of living in the Joker's shadow and is willing to torture anyone in his way to prove his point, even if it's just a couple of po uh, couple of woefully undertrained podcasters like Nick and I. So send in just one copy of your form. That's all Roman needs to exact punishment for our poor podcasting. Just keep in mind, however, that this supervillain isn't known for being fair and that he may come pay you a visit as well. So think twice before you hit that enter button. It might be the last time you see your fingers. Wow. <laughs> well, thanks again, Todd. What an absolute treat. Yeah. Thank you very blast. much. Tim, Nick, this has been the best day of my life. I'll, Excellent. I'm good with that. There, I we'll said take it. That. All right. I, and, and look, I was at the birth of my children. <laughs> <laughs> and this is better. This, is, this exceeds that. There we go. Yeah. All right, guys, that's going to wrap us up for the FSF Popcast. Goodbye. Bye. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of the FSF Popcast, we want to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please contact us by means of Twitter or Instagram using the handle at FSF Popcast or go to www.fsfpopcast.com and click on the contact me link. Thanks again and hope you enjoyed the episode. Copyright 2023 FSF Podcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Podcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels.